During the restoration of this SX-62A, I received a number of comments, questions, and suggestions about the level of detail, especially having to do with vacuum tubes. A lot of people uh, have never even had a course on vacuum tubes. Most uh, vacuum tube courses ended uh, 40 years ago or so, and so uh, one suggestion that I got was to perhaps do a little bit of a tutorial on vacuum tubes, the theory and applications. And by theory, I don't mean complicated math. I mean just uh, a simple, straightforward explanation of uh, how vacuum tubes are made, how they operate, and then under applications, some of the typical circuits that vacuum tubes are used in. And once again, I'm going to take a focus that is one that I taught many, many years ago, and it's the way I learned vacuum tubes. It was very non-mathematical, and so uh, this is intended for people who are either beginners, that is, have never seen a course on vacuum tubes or studied them in any detail, as well as those people who haven't looked at vacuum tubes for many, many years, but would kind of like a refresher. So let's go on and get started with that. I first learned about vacuum tubes from a mentor in, that I met in high school who was a friend of my uncle. His name was Glenn, and my uncle, his name was Jimmy, uh, conspired to get me some training because Glenn had some, and so I used to go over to his house and he would teach me about uh, radio and about vacuum tubes and, and so on. Uh, my uncle would go to garage sales and estate sales and buy me old radios and TVs to work on. And so between the two of them, they managed to get me to a point where I was very interested, but, but not as well educated as I would have liked to have been. And so a little later, I wound up teaching uh, a course in, on electron tubes that was that came from this technical manual. This is an Army technical manual, and the place I was teaching was the uh, Army Signal School at Fort Monmouth in New Jersey. Now, this particular technical manual was published in 1952, so the descriptions were intended to be used in uh, training uh, Army radio repair technicians. And that's the approach I'm going to take. Basically, I haven't taught this way in over 50 years. Uh, a lot of this stuff I learned uh, 55 or uh, close to 60 years ago. So I hope I'll be able to recreate some of the thrill that I found at the time of learning about electron tubes, how they worked, and at the time, I'm only going to be using simple mathematics. Add, subtract, multiply, divide. That's it. Electron tubes began as a, an accident waiting to happen. What I mean by that is, they, the first experiments that produced an electron tube were actually experiments to try to prevent the filament of light bulbs from burning out. And some of those experiments were done at the Edison lab. This is an experiment that they carried out in which they heated the filament, they evacuated the air out of the glass, and then they put a plate inside the evacuated envelope near the filament and applied voltages to the plate. Now, in this case, the, uh, they only have a galvanometer connected to the plate. And what they were trying to determine was whether they could, by putting a plate here, they could absorb some of the electrons that gathered around this filament. Now, they didn't know they were electrons at the time. They actually thought that it was just impurities that were being boiled off. But nonetheless, they stuck this together, they put a galvanometer on it, and they discovered that there was a little bit of current. 
that flowed through this galvanometer. Now notice here that the battery only supplies the filament with energy to get hot. You could actually do the same thing if, if uh, you've ever used a magnifying glass to uh, get something uh, hot. You could actually focus the sun's energy on this filament and get the same effect. In other words, you could eliminate the battery and just have the galvanometer between one lead of this filament. Heat up the filament and connect the galvanometer to the plate and you'd get the same result. Well, later they discovered that the, what was going on, uh, a man by the name of J.J. Thompson figured out that electrons were being emitted by the filament, also sometimes called the cathode, but nonetheless the emitting source, and were being carried over to the plate. And that was what was actually being measured on the galvanometer were electrons. Now up until that time, nobody really knew what electricity inside a vacuum was. One of the next things that someone did was insert a battery in the plate. And what they discovered was if they put a positive voltage on the plate, that is positive relative to the cathode, that the current would increase dramatically. And what was going on here is when you heat up any surface, electrons collect above the surface. They're boiled off. This even happens in a campfire. But only in a vacuum it, are the electrons free to move any significant distance without colliding with something like air molecules or whatever. So if you put a vacuum here and you heat this up to produce this cloud of electrons, kind of like a mist over a lake uh, in the morning when the, when the lake is warm and the air is cool, some of this cloud of electrons will be attracted to this plate. The more positive the plate, since electrons have a negative charge, the more positive the plate, the more electrons will be attracted. And so that produced a device that was called a diode. A diode simply means it's two electrodes. The ode comes from the same word as electrode, and the di means two. This is an example of a simple plot of plate current, that is the amount of current flowing this way, versus the plate voltage. And as you see, as the plate voltage increases, the plate current increases also. It's not a perfectly straight line, but it's fairly linear. Eventually, diodes were produced in an envelope like this, with the filament in the center, the plate surrounding the outside. This is a half wave, in other words, a, a one plate uh, diode. Of course, there's a glass envelope to hold the vacuum. And there are glass stems inside that hold things like the filament supports. The getter is a material that is flashed. That is, it's heated from the outside, with, usually with an induction heater. And it actually flashes, kind of like flash powder. And the purpose of that is to eat up the rest of the oxygen that might be in the tube, even after they've evacuated it. And then, of course, there a base was installed with pins at the bottom, so you could make contact to the circuit. Now, as we saw, when you put a positive voltage on the plate, you get current, that is electrons flowing from the cathode. And here, the heater and cathode are shown separately, and I'll explain that in just a second. But the electrons are shown flowing to the plate, and then through a meter, and to the battery. That's when the plate is positive. When the plate is negative, however, no current flows. The reason is that when the plate is negative and the electrons are negative, like charges oppose or repel. So the electrons that are being boiled off here collect in a cloud, but they're being pushed down by this negative electric field against the negative field of the uh, electrons. There are basically two ways used to produce electrons. One is to coat the filament 
with a material that is very active. In other words, will emit electrons when it's heated up. That is, uh, in that case, normally the filament is uh, not called the cathode, it's simply called the filament. And you have to make direct electrical connection to this in order to attract electrons. There's a second way of doing it, which is to put a sleeve of emitting material around the heater. In that case, the filament is called the heater and the sleeve is called the cathode. I know it gets a little confusing, but you'll soon discover that most tubes that you will see are done this way. A few power tubes are done this way where you want maximum heating. Obviously, some heat is lost in this situation, and so these tubes aren't quite as efficient. But in normal radio and television applications, that's all you need. In high power transmitters, for example, uh, sometimes they use this structure. But nonetheless, they coat a material onto this cathode, put the cathode around the heater, but insulated from the heater. Now, the interesting thing now is, the voltages on the heater and the voltages on the cathode can be quite different. And that can be an advantage that we will see later on. This is also what is known as an indirectly heated cathode. One of the obvious applications for a half-wave diode is as a rectifier circuit. A rectifier circuit is one that changes alternating current into direct current. And the way it does that is when the input is positive on the plate relative to the cathode, electrons flow up through the capacitor and through the load to the cathode and then from the cathode over to the plate and back to the source. That causes the bottom end of this capacitor to be negative and the top end to be positive. When the current reverses so that the plate is negative with respect to the cathode, as we saw in an earlier picture, no current flows. So during that time, it's as though this was an open circuit. And during that time, charge that's been stored on this capacitor can feed the load. So basically the load is fed through the tube for the positive half cycle and is fed out of the capacitor during the negative half cycle, thereby changing alternating current into direct current. If you have two di diodes and a center tapped transformer, you can set up this kind of circuit. It's a full wave rectifier. By full wave, the idea is to keep current flowing through this capacitor on both the positive and negative cycles, but to make sure that it always flows in this direction. So the top is just like the previous circuit, that is when this is positive, current flows up through the capacitor from the cathode to the plate and back to the transformer. When this is negative, from transformer theory you know that when one end is, is negative, the other end relative to the center is positive. Well, when this one is positive, current flows through the capacitor and through this diode to the plate and back. So, you may have noticed we are charging this capacitor on the positive half cycle and then we are also charging it on the negative half cycle in the same direction. This produces a, a steadier DC current that is one that is more constant over each cycle. Diodes are also used as AM detectors, AM meaning amplitude modulation. In this case, the input is tuned to some frequency. In this case, let's say that's the radio frequency of the station you're listening to. The diode causes current to flow in one direction and basically cuts off the bottom half of the uh, RF. In doing so, it produces a wave that you see down here whose amplitude varies with the amplitude of the incoming RF signal. 
So if you have an AM signal here and you tune this secondary to that frequency across this capacitor, and this capacitor is usually a fairly large capacitor relative to this one, across this capacitor you will get an average voltage and the capacitor will essentially short out the RF part of the input, leaving across it a slowly varying audio signal. And then that audio signal is then applied to your audio amplifier. You'll see these detectors a lot in AM radios. And a similar, though slightly more complicated circuit is used to detect FM. We will not talk about that here. A specialized kind of diode is also used as a voltage regulator. Now, by specialized kind of diode, what I mean is it still has two active elements. In this particular case, the cathode is cold. That is, there's no heater or filament in this tube, just a cathode. The space, instead of being filled with a vacuum, is filled with a gas that has the property that the gas breaks down at a particular voltage. That is, the, the pressure of gas in this tube and the spacing between the cathode and plate are carefully adjusted in manufacture so that at a particular voltage, for example, 150 volts, the space between these will break down and electrons will flow from this cold cathode to the plate. So if you put a, a, an unregulated DC, let's say DC that is varying from uh, say 170 volts up to 200 volts and back down again, and you put a resistor in series, what happens is this tube conducts more current the, the higher the voltage. So as this point tries to go up, it starts at 170 volts, but because the tube is conducting, it drops 20 volts across this resistor. So 170 minus 20 leaves 150. Now when you put 200 volts here, the tube will still be 150 and the 50 volt difference will be dropped across the resistor. So the effect is that the output is a regulated direct current that is fairly stable. After the invention of the diode, a man by the name of Lee DeForest began experimenting with the idea of trying to control the current between the plate, between the filament and the plate, or the cathode and the plate, in a way without varying the plate voltage. That is, trying to put some kind of structure in between that would either increase or decrease the current flow. This was called a grid. And so DeForest created this multi-element tube with a filament, it's also the cathode, a grid in between, and a plate. And the way it works basically is, you remember I told you that the plate is positive, the electrons are negative, so they're attracted to the positive plate. But if you put a negative grid, that is, if you put this grid in and apply a negative voltage here relative to the filament, that negative voltage will repel those electrons and fewer of them will get through. Now this isn't a solid plate, so it doesn't stop all the electrons. And the more negative you make this grid, the more it cuts off the electron flow. This type of tube was called a triode, once again, because it's three electrodes. The battery used to supply the filament began to be called the A battery. The battery to supply the plate was called the B battery. So the battery to supply the grid was called the C battery. Later this was called the bias battery. So here you see is a circuit to test how a triode works. You'll notice that there is a voltage that is applied to the grid that is called the C bias and that can be varied. It can be either a negative value or a positive value. There is a plate voltage and of course not shown here is the filament voltage, the A battery. Well when you do that what you get is a curve that looks like this. 
This is the negative grid voltage. This is positive grid voltage. This is plate current. So as you see, as you drive the grid very negative, the current will go to zero. As you bring the grid to neutral, the tube becomes a, a diode. It's simply a diode with zero volts on the grid. It's as though the grid were not there. Then as you add positive voltage to the grid, it does the reverse. Instead of repelling electrons, it actually attracts them and speeds them up. And so the current in the tube actually goes above the diode point up to some saturation level. And then once you reach saturation level, the tube becomes relatively flat. Actually, at some points, it can even fall off a little bit because what happens is some of the electrons, instead of flying through the grid and hitting the plate, start collecting on the plate on the grid and coming out into the circuit. So here is how you might use a triode to produce an amplified signal. Notice here the C battery is supplying a grid bias, but there's also an input resistor. And across that resistor we can put a varying voltage. That varying voltage will add to and subtract from the bias. Similarly, on the plate we have a, a B battery supplying plate voltage. As the plate voltage varies, that will cause more or less voltage to develop across here, thereby producing an output voltage that varies in place with the electron flow or the plate current. So, we have produced a, an amplifier if the plate current is substantially more than the grid current because, for example, suppose this input resistor and this output resistor are the same. And let's suppose we develop one volt across the input resistor. Well, since these are the same, if the current through this is, is higher than the current through this, the voltage across this will be greater. Let's suppose the current through this is five times the current through this resistor and they're equal resistors. That means we have a gain of five. One volt across here, five volts across here. Here is a cutaway view of the construction of a triode. Now notice that the plate is on the outside. Inside, between the plate and the cathode, is the control grid. That's the spiral structure here. And then on the very inside is the cathode. And inside the cathode is the heater, making this an indirectly heated cathode. And because it has three active elements, a plate, a control grid, and a cathode, it's called a triode. I mentioned the spiral control grid in the, the triode we just looked at. There are a number of ways that you can construct control grids. This is a more or less uniform control grid, that is even spacing. This has variable spacing and it's used in a special kind of tube called a variable mu tube or a variable uh, amplification tube. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Here is a flat oval type. There are other types. This is the ladder. You have two insulators and you wrap the wire around the insulators this way. This is a circular helix. This is similar to the one we just looked at. And then there are some special types that are used in microwave tubes and other things of that sort. Normally, when you are looking at the description of a piece of electronic equipment using electron tubes, you don't see the cutaway view. Instead, what you see is what's called the schematic symbol. This is the schematic symbol of a 6C4 triode. At the top is the plate. That is the thing around the outside. Below that is the control grid. That's that spiral structure. Below that is the cathode. That is the thing that gets heated by the, the heater. And then below that is the heater. Around the outside are shown the pins. So, for example, the heater is connected from pin 3 to pin 4. The plate 
is connected to pin 5, and you may notice the plate also comes out on pin 1. It's not uncommon for there to be more than one pin. The control grid is on pin 6, and the cathode is on pin 7. Pin 2 has no connection. If you look in a tube manual, you may see a picture similar to this. This is a 6A3 triode. It's very similar to the 6C4 we just looked at. Here is the schematic symbol. And this may be somewhat intimidating to someone, but it really is very simple. It is, it is simply a graph of the plate current and uh, the plate voltage. So, for example, this is 250 volts on the plate. This is 100 milliampers of plate current. So, okay, what are all these curves? Well, these curves are curves that show you how the two will operate at a particular bias voltage. So this is with no bias voltage, grid voltage of zero. If the grid is 10 volts negative, the tube will operate along this curve. So, for example, if you have 150 volts on the plate and minus 10 volts on the grid, you will have just under 125 milliampers of plate current. So don't be intimidated by these uh, curves. They simply are a way to give you a picture and also a way to do some graphical design. We aren't going to talk about amplifier design here. We're just talking about operation and basic circuits. But you can actually use this chart to design an amplifier. Shortly after triodes began to be developed, the uh, attempt was made to control the characteristics of triodes even more by inserting a third grid, uh, I'm sorry, a second grid called a screen grid. And it was inserted between the first grid now called the control grid, and the plate. Normally, the control grid in those days was connected to a top cap. That was done to reduce capacitance because by bringing the leads of the control grid out through the bottom of the tube, it was very near all the other elements. And in those days, it was hard to control the capacitance of those leads, so they brought it out the top. That resulted in this kind of tube that is a tetrode or four element tube. On the left is one used for receiving. On the right is one that was used for transmitting. Of course, the only difference being it was intended to carry a lot more current. The reason that that extra grid was called a screen grid was that its, its purpose was to reduce the coupling between the plate and the grid. At this time, a lot of the radios were called tuned radio frequency or TRF receivers. That meant that the plate was tuned to the same frequency as the grid. And what they noticed was as they tried to increase the amplification, the tube would begin to oscillate. So a screen grid was placed between the two to cut down the control grid to plate capacitance, which is where the, the feedback was occurring, causing the oscillation. For the screen grid to operate effectively, it has to be operated at a potential that is higher than the cathode, but lower than the plate. And so, as you see in this depiction, a battery is tapped. Now, of course, normally in an AC powered receiver, you don't actually have batteries. Instead, you would have a resistive divider that the plate supply would come from a higher voltage point than the screen supply. This helped TRF receivers to operate at higher gain However, it had one 
unfortunate consequence. And that was the characteristics were really messed up down here when the plate voltage drops down near the screen voltage. You'll notice this in Incredible nonlinearity here. Now, as long as the plate voltage is very high relative to the cathode and the screen grid, the tube operates almost like uh, a triode and everything is fine. But when you apply a large voltage to the input, the plate swings a lot. So, for example, the plate might swing from 250 volts down to 100 volts or maybe even 50 volts. And if it does, all of a sudden, instead of this nice linear characteristic, you start getting this incredible distortion. So, an attempt was made to find out why that was occurring. Well, it turns out that what was happening is that as electrons would hit the plate, they would bounce off, some of them, back into space. Well, if the screen grid was nearly as positive, or in some cases even more positive, than the plate, those electrons, instead of flowing out of the plate, would flow out through the screen grid. So, this so-called secondary emission at the plate was made worse by a screen grid, particularly if the screen grid voltage was close to or above the plate voltage. And that's what was causing this incredible nonlinearity. So, the next attempt was to correct that. And as you may have guessed, the way they corrected that was by adding yet another grid. You'll notice at the top that there are three grids. An inner grid, the control grid, a second grid, the screen grid, a third grid, now called the suppressor grid. Suppressor because it suppressed the effect of secondary emission. So let's look at that in a circuit and see how it did it. So this is a pentode, that is a tube with five active elements, a cathode, a control grid, sometimes called grid one, a screen grid, sometimes called grid two, and a suppressor grid, sometimes called grid three, and of course the plate. So how did it work? Well, by putting cathode potential on the suppressor grid, it basically blocked the electrons. Remember the, the cathode is very negative relative to the plate. So if an electron bounced off the plate due to secondary emission, it would be less likely to, to be attracted to grid 2 if in between there was an element that was very negative. And that's what G3 or the suppressor grid did. Because these grids were very open, electrons flow generally through them very easily. And particularly with a high enough plate voltage, the electrons acquired enough velocity that they would slam into the plate. That actually was the reason you had secondary emission, was the velocity of the electrons was kind of high. But now you can gain the advantages of a screen grid tube, that is isolating the plate from the grid a little bit better, and also not have the nonlinearities associated with the tetrode. So if you look in a tube manual under a pentode, what you find are a set of characteristics. Once again, this is various values of bias voltage. This is plate current and this is plate voltage. Here is your pentode. But you'll notice that now the tube is considerably better behaved. That is, as the plate voltage drops down, at some point it reaches a point at which the plate current drops begins to drop off quite a bit. But at a much lower voltage. Notice that at 50 volts here, 
this tube is still operating on a relatively linear part of its curve. As you saw earlier, the pento or the tetrode that we looked at, by the time you got down to 50 volts, had a big dip in the plate characteristics or the plate current. So now you have a tube that not only provides isolation between the grid and the plate, but also doesn't have the nonlinearities of the tetrode. Here is a cutaway of what I would call a modern pentode, that is modern a 19, late 1950s, early 1960s pentode. This is the 6CB6. It was used a lot in IF amplifiers and even in some RF amplifiers of radios and television sets. Once again, it has five active elements plus a heater and it provided a superior tube. Not only was it less likely to oscillate, but also it provided more gain, uh, more amplification, and also a higher plate resistance, which we will talk about in just a few seconds. A second approach to the problem of secondary emission was what is called a beam power tube. Now this is a top-down look at a beam power tube and what is unusual about it are these beam forming plates which we'll talk about in a second. You may notice there's a cathode in the center. This is the control grid. This is the screen grid. Notice there's no suppressor grid. This is actually a tetrode but it operates like a, a pentode. And the reason is these beam forming plates force the electrons into a narrow beam between the cathode and the plate. And that beam, in essence, sweeps up secondary electrons. Let's talk about that. An electron leaves the cathode with pretty high velocity because it's being attracted by the plate. It hits the plate and bounces off. Now you may notice, remember in a pentode, there's a suppressor grid in here to repel it back. In a beam power tube, by focusing the beam, it's the electrons themselves, that is those that are coming off of the cathode at high speed in this direction, that produce an almost impenetrable cloud of high velocity electrons headed toward the plate. So this electron that bounced off gets swept up by those high velocity electron uh, cloud and gets carried right back to the plate. It doesn't have an opportunity to get all the way back to the screen grid. You may recall that we looked earlier at a grid structure in which the grid is fairly close here and very widely spaced in the middle. This is a special grid structure used in a pentode to produce what is called variable mu. We'll talk about mu in a little bit, but basically what it does is it produces a tube whose characteristics change with grid bias. This is a 6SJ or 6SK7. There's a cutaway view. The grid, it's a little hard to see, but it's more tightly wound at the ends than it is in the center. And it produces a characteristic like this. That is, this is for a given plate current and a given grid voltage. I point out this is a different kind of graph than the one we've looked at before. This is the uh, amplification factor, for example, of a 6SK7. You'll notice that as the grid voltage gets more negative, the amplification drops off. Here it's amplifying a lot. You apply a little negative voltage, it amplifies less, and so on. Why would you want that? Well, in radios and in TVs, you want to be able to vary the amplification so that as the signal varies, 
the loudspeaker doesn't go from whispers to booms, but rather holds the volume constant. That is called an automatic volume control. We won't talk about those circuits specifically here, but they are used in radios and TVs. In TVs, they're often called a GC, automatic gain control, whereas in radios, they're usually called automatic volume control, or AVC. So, variable mu pentodes were developed as IF amplifiers so that they would respond better to automatic volume control. So now the dreaded math. Here you see the formulas for three constants or three values that are used to represent the quality of a tube. Don't get upset by the, uh, the math. This is simply a division. You're dividing a change in base uh, voltage or B voltage by the change in C voltage. And that produces the amplification constant. That is the amplification factor. How much is the output changed by the input? A second calculation is the plate resistance, and you may see these. Plate resistance, once again, is simply a ratio, in this case, of a voltage to a current. That is the plate voltage, EB, to the plate current, IB. And finally, there is this term transconductance. Transconductance just means it's like the, the effect of the grid on the plate current, not on the plate voltage. Here you see is the grid voltage on the plate voltage. Here it's the grid voltage on the plate current, IB, is called GM. And that's measured in MOS, M-H-O-S. It's called a MO because it's actually ohm spelled backwards. And in case you're scared by the term transconductance, conductance is just one over resistance. In other words, it's what is mathematically called the reciprocal of resistance. So transconductance is the same as one over the trans resistance. In other words, the effective resistance of the tube from its grid to its plate. We won't use these very much, but you may see them in a, a tube manual. And if you just remember that they are simply ratios, that is, it's simply one number divided into another, you, you won't be as timid or afraid of them as I was when I first encountered them. If your interest has been piqued by this presentation, that you might want to download a copy of this technical manual. Here is the number, TM11662, and then slash, uh, TM stands for technical manual, uh, the slash TO, the TO stands for technical order, 16-1-255. I believe if you just enter TM11 662 into a search engine, you'll find a PDF version of this book. It's a wonderful source. It contains all of what I've talked about today. It also has a lot more. And once again, I promise you, because I taught from this book for, for a period of time at the Signal School, there's no math beyond simple add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And yet, if you read the whole book, you will become as knowledgeable of, on electron tubes as anybody from that time or since. So, I hope you've enjoyed this little introduction to electron tubes and how they work. I'm going to do another section on electron tube circuits, but I thought I'd separate this so that it doesn't run too long. Once again, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you'll stay tuned for the 
electron tube circuits video. But in either case, have a good day and we'll see you in the future.